Well, ladies and gentlemen, if I could uh, call us to order, please. Uh, my name is Alistair McGrath, and I'm the Idris Chair of Science and Religion here at Oxford. I'm delighted to welcome you to this third seminar this term at the Anne Ramsey Centre. Our speaker tonight is Tom Simpson, who's an Associate Professor of Philosophy and Public Policy here in Oxford, based at the School of Government, and also a Senior Research Fellow at Wadham. And what he's going to do in this talk is to look at some ideas of Ned Hall, who's a Harvard philosopher of science, about the epistemic virtues of science compared with uh, the rather, in his view, lesser virtues of religion. And Tom is going to open that up for us. It sounds like it will be a very interesting talk indeed. Before I welcome Tom to the podium, can I just check you all of handouts? I think these might be quite helpful to follow in the talk. Does anybody not have a handout? I think, therefore, we will just uh, start oh, circulating oh, them, really sure. and we will hope that they will oh. migrate around as we go. Please welcome Tom Simpson, who's going to speak to us tonight. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you very much, Alistair, and it's a real pleasure and uh, privilege to be here tonight. And um, uh, it's always good when the applause is at the start, at least there's one for the evening. Uh, so what I've got to say is uh, all the substance is captured on the handout, um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to that. And I'll talk for about 40 minutes, and then we've got plenty of time for Q&A at the end of that and to hear your comments and, uh, and discussion. So what, what this has really come out of is a, a, a dinner. A dinner is a great place to do philosophy that I was at last, about a year ago. In, uh, I've come from this Cambridge, UK's Cambridge, and uh, in the other Cambridge, Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, uh, next to Boston, where there's a meeting of MIT and Harvard faculty and from a number of other universities there. And Ned Hall gave a response to a, actually a British nuclear scientist who'd recently written a book on, um, on the relationship between science and faith. And uh, I, thought, I thought Ned Hall had the better of the discussion, if I can say that sort of <laughs> politely. And I felt like uh, the, the questions he raised, the points he made, were worthy of a, of a, uh, of a, of a genuine response. And indeed, the response to it is, uh, it, this is not just a negative talk. I'm not just trying to sort of knock down two arguments against. I'm really using this as a foil to develop more positively uh, a way of thinking about the kind of justification that religious belief, and in particular the religious belief uh, of believers who, uh, who, are, who are adherents to revealed religions, is susceptible of. Uh, so hopefully there'll be some more positive uh, food for thought at the end. And it's worth saying, uh, I'm, I'm a philosopher, but I'm very much assuming that a lot of the audience is not, uh, not paid up professional philosophers. So I'm not going to dot all the I's and cross all the T's in philosophical speak. I'm, I'm trying to make sure that it's accessible. And um, those of you who are professionals will hopefully bear with me where I slide over some stuff. OK, so the, here's the macro, the macro thought. Science is a threat to religious belief. If you take your science seriously, you're going to find that there are challenges to the kind of justification that religious belief uh, uh, w will have. And uh, so if we take the practice of natural science, you know, it just seems like when you look at it, natural science has done extraordinarily well over the last two, three hundred years at revealing truths about the world that we did not know beforehand. And there's a method there which has been revelatory. There's all sorts of stuff we know now that we didn't know previously. And um, uh, yeah, so, so if, if, you're kind of, if your epistemology is going to pay attention to the real world, you've got to wrestle seriously with the fact that there's something going on here in this way of finding out about the world which, um, uh, which works. And so a bottom-up epistemology is going to take account of, uh, of some of the lessons that we learn from scientific practice. So this is, so I'm now speaking in uh, Ned Hall's voice, so to speak. I'm exegeting his objection. So this is the starting point. And what he says is that when we, when we think about science, there's, there's two aspects to this. So the, the successful scientific method has, if you like, there's a narrow part at the core of it, uh, which you might, is sometimes labelled by philosophers of science, the hypothetico-deductive method. So it's roughly, there's a kind of, there's a causal relationship that's posited uh, on the basis of this causal relationship. We predict certain things that will, that will uh, uh, certain observations that we'll get from experiments. We go out, we do the experiments, we measure it, we see if, if those predictions are borne out, and we, we test it against alternative hypotheses. So there's a sort of, there's a fairly narrow sense of what scientific practice is here. But there's also what he calls a, like a wide reading of the kinds of practices, the kinds of uh, epistemic habits 
which scientists exhibit and which have wider lessons outside of just the practice of natural science. And Ned Hall's claim is that it's this second category which has got an undermining effect on religious belief. And, uh, you know, he's, he's very careful, so he gives, uh, uh, as it were, a scope restriction, so he recognises uh, that there are going to be some ways that we have of finding out about the world uh, which are not subject to this, uh, but he thinks that this is going to be generally pretty trivial. So sensory perception, for instance, uh, simply kind of seeing that there's a glass of orange juice on the, on the lectern uh, is a kind of trivial form of knowledge, uh, but it seems like that's a form of knowledge which is not going to be, there aren't going to be many lessons to learn about uh, how that works that we get from science. Uh, but nonetheless, for a lot of other kinds of ways of finding out about the world, these lessons are applicable. Uh, so he says, there are many ways that individuals improve their understanding of the world which do not involve modi modifying those opinions in the light of clear and reproducible evidence. And uh, in particular, uh, Ned's very specific. So there are historical claims about Jesus uh, in, in Christianity. And these are, for him, they're subject to the wide reading, the wide lessons. So, for instance, the practice of history, he would take the practice of history to be subject to these, uh, these, uh, these wider lessons. And his claim uh, is there, 2F, to the extent that you self-consciously choose to abide by these standards, and within the domains within which it applies, does it thereby become harder for you to believe some specific set of religious doctrines? That's his question, and the answer for him is uh, unambiguously yes. Okay, so what are these um, uh, epistemic practices that are implicit in uh, the best kind of scientific inquiry, uh, but which are not this narrow, kind of narrow sense of, of science. Well, there's two in particular that he highlights. So uh, one is how individuals govern their beliefs. So one is individual focus and the other is focused on groups, how, how epistemic communities govern themselves. So the claim is for individuals, it's generally going to be the case for any live question in science that the individual scientist will only adopt a degree of belief towards the the claimed, uh, the claimed fact about the world. You don't believe it outright. So, uh, so there's, some, there's some causal law which has been investigated, which has been posited, and uh, there's a certain amount of evidence that's in, and on the basis of the evidence, we say this is probably the case. So, you know, like we have this all the time with climate, uh, climate change, don't we? So uh, the poor old scientist gets up on Radio 4 and says, all our best evidence says that it's very, very probably the case that... Uh, um, um, Human interventions have caused, have caused climate change. And some, the, the, the denier, the kind of evil denier gets up and says, aha, it's only probably, we don't actually know for sure. And there's this kind of perpetual misunderstanding between, between, um, uh, between the laity, uneducated laity, Boo, boo Hiss and, uh, and the scientists. But, you know, there's a serious point underlying that, isn't there? That, um, uh, that, that, it's, that, that active working scientists are going to be very, very careful to moderate the degree of, of belief, the degree of credence that they give to a scientific proposition, to the quality of the evidence that's in for it. And as a, as a working rule, I'm sure he's right in this, it's, I mean, it seems absolutely right, that, um, uh, that categories like belief, categories like knowledge, don't really seem applicable to, uh, to the working practice of, of science. You know, so there's, there's going to be some scientific theories that, you know, like the idea that we're mostly made of carbon, kind of... Maybe we know that one, but the moment you get to the sort of the frontiers of science for disputed questions, this holds. And, uh, and he sort of rather wryly observes, uh, in contrast, the devout Christian does not say in response to the question whether Jesus is the son of God, I consider that reasonably likely, but I'm waiting for more evidence to come in so that I can adjust my degree of confidence up or down. That's not the kind of... Um, <laughs> That's not sort of the way that church, you know, if you go to a church or, or a mosque or, um, uh, or a synagogue, that's not the kind of, in my, certainly in my experience, speaking from my religious tradition, that's not the kind of uh, 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 epistemic attitude that you're invited to adopt. You're invited to adopt a much more um, uh, robust one, if we can put it like that. Okay, so that's the first objection. There's this dissonance between how the individual scientist governs their belief in relation to the evidence and how the individual believer, uh, religious believer, uh, moderates their belief. So what's the second objection? Uh, 
So natural science at its best, not always the case, uh, but it, it ought to be governed by a norm of permitting heresy. So say you're running your scientific team uh, here in the university and some hotshot postdoc has come up with a theory which blows your life's work out of the water. What you're not supposed to do is just stamp on their career and kind of push them out the lab. <laughs> you know, what you're supposed to say is that's very, very interesting. It goes completely counter to everything that I've learned, but let's see what the evidence says. And so they're supposed to be, and this is the way science advances. And, you know, he's writing this. We wouldn't have got past Aristotle had this not been the case, had it not been the case that, uh, that within the community of science, there was an ability to say, this person disagrees, uh, but we're, we're going to wait and see uh, what the evidence is on, uh, on, this, on this matter. And so clearly, derogations from the norm are frequent enough, but they're, but they're criticisable. So uh, you should feel bad if you use your power to exclude uh, people who, uh, who disagree with, uh, with, with what you've done. And, um, and he wryly observes, <laughs> it seems like communities of believers are in general not governed by the same sort of norm of permit heresy. And uh, I quote, he, say, he says, so his history isn't great. He says the early church fathers, when they were about to burn the heretics, you know, it wasn't that they said, I'm about to burn you and I feel bad about this because part of the intrinsic values of our community are such that I should really permit you to thrive and pursue your heresy, but I can't bring myself to do it, so would you just pass me the match? I mean, so the, certainly the church, the Christian church is replete with examples um, uh, to our shame where this is this has not been uh, this has not been the case, and indeed, you know that seems that seems characteristic actually of the majority of religious um, movements. You know, perhaps there are some exceptions, but but the majority of sort of world specific, world significant religions which have specific doctrinal content, significant doctrinal content. Uh, this is not the norm uh, of encouraging a plurality of of uh, different approaches to what's going on. There's a, there's a sense that there's a core which you've got to buy, uh, buy into. And so there's a dissonance here again. And the thought is that there's a good justification for, uh, for this norm of permit heresy, which is that the community in the long run gets at truth in a way that it wouldn't do if it, if it uses its social power to enforce conformity on, uh, on a particular set of doctrines. Okay, so this is the, that's Ned Hall's uh, two objections. So what's the, um, uh, what's the response to it? So uh, uh, Hall's own, um, uh, his own view is that what we should do is give up religious doctrines. Uh, so there's, there's, there's no way these can be justified, or at least the degree of attachment to them can be justified uh, on uh, the basis of the evidence. And so even though he says, you know, you can understand how if someone has a, some kind of mystical, numinous experience, how that may change their attitude towards the world uh, and invite the possibility of some, something, some, there being some sort of supernatural and perhaps endorsing a religious practice as a way of as a way of expressing this conviction. But that's a very different attitude, he says, and he's writing that to, to actually endorsing the doctrines uh, of, of that particular uh, religious tradition. And for and some of you, this, this is maybe slightly more specific to philosophers, so some of you may be aware of uh, the work by a chap called Alvin Plantinga, an American uh, Christian philosopher, uh, arguing that each of us has a, has a sense of the divine within us, and that this leads to a uh, what he calls a basic belief, a basic conviction uh, that God exists. And, uh, and it, Hall doesn't make the connection, but that's become a very live and very popular way of thinking about religious belief within the philosophical community, uh, community of people who think about these things. Um, but it's, it's, it's very unclear how you get from there, from the sense of the divine, to again, the specific doctrinal content that characterises uh, uh, the revealed religion, certainly of Judaism, Christianity and Islam. So, uh, and certainly if you're, you know, if you're uh, personally committed, if you, think, uh, if you think that theism is true, that there is a God, a uh, God exists, um, then you're going to be disinclined. And if you take a, a sort of fairly conventional orthodox uh, view on these matters, you're going to be disinclined to take that route. So what are the other routes for someone who wants to resist the conclusion. Well, there are two in contrast. So 
One of them is to deny the contrast. So religious belief often displays these epistemic deficiencies that Hall's been identifying, but it shouldn't do. Okay, it shouldn't do. It should be as epistemically, it should be evaluable according to the same epistemic norms as science is. And the fact that in practice it falls short of this is no, uh, I mean, that's a cause for regret insofar as you're a member of the community which displays those deficiencies, but nonetheless, the lesson is we should try harder and we should make sure that we actually govern our belief, our religious beliefs, by the same canons. And um, two Oxford uh, uh, scholars who think about these things, one a philosopher, one a theologian, indeed one who's with us this very evening, I think can be categorised as taking roughly this route. Maybe I'll see you might want to say something uh, towards the conclusion whether I've rightly done so. But certainly Richard Swinburne, uh, who seeks to argue for the truth of Christianity on uh, as probably uh, uh, as... as uh, our best bet, given the evidence, this is probably true, uh, has a whole swathe, his lifetime's work really has been arguing, uh, given the evidence that we have, uh, it's probably the case that, that Christianity is true. And Alistair's own work is to, is to try and ground theology on a, uh, one of the central parts of it, I take it, is, is to ground theology on a scientific basis, to see the scientific method applied also to theology. And they're just two examples for Christianity. I've no doubt that, um, uh, although I know the literature's less well, uh, within uh, thinkers from other traditions, the same you'll see the same basic move being made. So that's one route. Now the other route is what I'm going to argue for uh, this evening, which is to accept the contrast. So there really is a contrast here in both situations between the religious believer and uh, and the scientist in terms of their belief forming practices, but deny that it's improper, and that's what I'm going to set about. Uh, trying to do for the uh, for the remainder of the talk. So let me um, let me tr let me try and give the basic outline uh, sort of way of thinking here. So when you think about how it is that we come to know something, um, philosophers who thought about this tend to think that you might have uh, five very general very broad, broad ranging ways of knowing that we can identify. So one of these is sense perception. So we have the modalities of sense perception. Uh, another is memory. You know, we remember uh, what, what, what happened yesterday, or we don't, according to how old we are. Uh, we, another is rational inference. So, uh, so deductive, uh, logic, maths, uh, abductive uh, uh, and inductive. Uh, process of, uh, of um, inference, the best explanation. We also have introspection, you know, we, we sort of, we look inside ourselves to see whether we feel pain and such like. And then a fifth one is testimony. So uh, you listen to the Today programme on Radio 4 when you get up, you're being told a whole bunch of things about the world. You open the Times, uh, you know, you ask for directions on the street. Someone is telling you things, telling you facts, and you're learning on the basis of their having told you so. And my contention is that the way of knowing that is distinctive for religious believers in revealed traditions is that it's belief on the basis of testimony and not on the basis of inference to the best explanation. And it's just a category mistake to try and assimilate religious belief to inference to the best explanation. Rather, what we should do is recognise it as, dis as belonging to the distinctive kind that it does, namely believing because someone has told you so. And in some sense, this is an easier argument for me to make just now because we have, just in the last 20 years, 25 years, there's been an explosion of interest within uh, philosophy, within analytic epistemology, in the conditions under which we know by believing what other people have said, the epistemology of testimony. So, in a religious tradition, what is it, you know, whose say-so is it that we're invited to believe? Well, right at the heart of it, so there are other people around, you know, maybe you've been brought up by, uh, by parents who are committed, and initially your belief, you know, your, your personal religious commitment may be on the basis of your parents, but ultimately the core justification is going to be 
either on the basis of God's direct say, so God has said, the word of the Lord has said, or a prophet, so someone who claims to have been inspired by God and to pass on to, to us, to the, to the hearers, what God has said. Or in the case specifically of Christianity, of God incarnate, Jesus walking the earth saying, uh, I and the Father are one and here, you know on the basis of my privileged knowledge all the things that I now tell you. And it seems, actually, when you think about it, it's, it's going to be pretty obvious. You don't get... Uh, so let me put the contrast this way. So I'm sure, you know, this is a very educated Oxford audience, uh, we, all of you will have explored the cosmological argument or the ontological argument or the, tele the argument from design, teleological argument, etc. Even if any, all of those arguments were shown to be absolutely sound, valid, so truth-preserving, and from true premises that no one could, could question, and that the rational person ought to be persuaded by them. Even if all of that was the case, and that's disputed, you'd never get anything more than the conclusion than that God exists, you know, an omnipotent, omni omnibenevolent, uh, omniscient uh, uh, being exists. And what you don't get is the specific, the really specific doctrinal content that's really characteristic of, of most religions. So in the case of Christianity, the idea that Jesus died uh, to save us as, a, as an atoning sacrifice and that there's a resurrection. I mean, you don't get those ideas on the basis of natural theology and mutatis mutandis for other, um, other traditions. And this point has sort of... Uh, Surprisingly few people have actually noticed this. I mean, astonishingly few people for my, for my money. Um, but the, uh, so I give a reference there, Nick Denyo, uh, Cambridge, Cambridge um, classicist actually, uh, has, has made this claim that really it's on the basis of testimony. And what I'm doing here is in some sense fleshing out the consequences of that. Okay, so this is, this is the roadmap. Understanding religious belief rightly is to see it as being based on testimony, not as being based on inference the best explanation like science. And I'm going to reply to the two arguments that, uh, that Hall gives now. So the first, reply to the first argument, my strategy here is to say that with testimony, knowledge and outright belief is the appropriate response to being told something. And um, uh, so maybe as I was talking earlier, you were saying, you were thinking to yourself, okay, so someone tells me something, you know, like John Nocty on Radio 4 says something, and, you know, but I am going through a process of evaluation and weighing it up, and maybe actually what I am doing there is, is evaluate, you know, I'm kind of giving a process of inference the best explanation about, is this chap lying to me, or do they, does he know what he's talking about? And... Um, and so actually, it's not obvious that testimony is different to inference the best explanation. I don't know if anyone was having that thought there. And uh, if you were, you're in very good company, uh, because David Hume, who's a sort of very noted Scottish philosopher, had exactly that same thought uh, back in the uh, 18th century. And he's gone down in sort of in the labels as what's now called a reductionist about testimony. So he thinks that the justification that you have for believing uh, someone's testimony, what, what someone says to you, is the same justification as, as induction. It's co it's an, it, there's an observed correlation of people saying things in the past and they're being borne out to be true. And on the basis of that observed correlation, I'm entitled to project into the future on this instance. And um, if you're as a sort of general heuristic, if you're ever sceptical about what David Hume says, uh, go to his great interlocutor at the time, uh, Thomas Reed in Aberdeen. And Thomas Reed says, look, that can't be the case. If we applied a default assumption of scepticism, we'd never learn anything at all. So we just don't have the kind of evidential base of observed correlation to justify the kind of vast and far-reaching reliance that we place on other people's word. And anyway, you, you, kind of, you can't get up and running without this default assumption of trust. So as a child growing up, you're totally reliant on what it is that your parents or the community around you uh, tell you. And Reed has gone down in history as, a, as a, what's called an anti-reductionist. So he thinks that testimony is distinctive and shouldn't be reduced to a form of testimony. So if you're, a, if you're an anti-reductionist, about testimony, you get a kind of very quick and easy 
uh, get out from Hall's argument. Uh, because it's just very clear that the default assumption is one of trust, there's a default of acceptance. And it seems like when things go well, that default is also going to give you knowledge because it's based on a reliable uh, process which has mediated the, uh, the claim. I'm going to skip the, uh, the long quotation from Austin there as I've, I've, just, I've tried to make the point with an alternative. Uh, alternative explanation. And um, th uh, the references on there are to, are to uh, sort of prominent early anti-reductionists. You can see in the early 90s, that's when the debate uh, really gets going. And um, so he here's another way to try and sort of um, kind of prime, prime the pump, sort of to get you to see the, the thought that's going on here. So um, maybe testimony, when you, when you tell someone something, is less like what I as the speaker am doing is not giving you evidence for that. So uh, here's what it would be to give you evidence. So, um, so Salome walks into, walks into, or rather the soldier walks in after Salome's dance before Herod with the head of John the Baptist on the plate. Okay. So what, what, the, what the head of John the Baptist is being presented as is as evidence that John the Baptist has died. It's kind of, you know, there's a direct causal correlation between the head being there and John the Baptist being dead. When, when, but what I do when I give you, when I tell you something, is it's more like I'm promising to you that, that the world is as I've, as I've said it, said it is. And when I give you when I give you my prompt when I give you my word when I pledge that the world is in this way, you're then you're you're kind of you're offered a choice as to whether or not you accept my freely given assurance, my freely given promise, or whether you decide to subject it to the kind to a kind of evidential scrutiny which sees whether you know I've said that the world is is this way, and uh, and um, you as the hearer have now got to infer whether. In whether or not I in fact believe what I've said, uh, you know, because I could have lied to you. And then once you've inferred, you know, if you do that I haven't lied to you, you've then got to, you've got to kind of go through a process of explanation to infer whether or not what I believe matches up with the world, because I could have got it wrong, couldn't I? And that seems, that sort of, that two-step process seems to mis misconstrue the kind of moral transaction that takes place in testimony, that it's that, it's, that I'm offering you my word. So another way to think about it would be, uh, you know, if you don't believe someone, do you tell them that, I don't, that you don't believe them? Well, you might do, but it's kind of rude. And it's, kind of, it's, you know, it's sort of setting up a confrontation. And, uh, and you kind of, you've got to work out for yourself whether that's the, sort of the right thing to do. So th there's a kind of disrespect involved in rejecting someone's, someone's word. So, and that, that disrespect might be a kind of indicator that there's a kind of moral transaction going on here. And that really the response that I'm invited to give to testimony is, is, is one of belief or disbelief. It's, it's binary, it's not credence. The moment I start adopting degrees of belief, of credences towards what you've said, I've actually stepped out of an IU relationship and I've stepped into a, into a he or she, the speaker, and me, and I'm now evaluating them as a, as a kind of a truth meter of the moment. Okay. Now, uh, this is controversial, this, this picture within philosophy, but a lot of people are very attracted to it. And if you're attracted to it and you want to think about it uh, further, the reference I give there to Richard Moran's paper in 2006 is the, is the key source for this, for this line of thought. Now, uh, I'm not actually very attracted to it. And, uh, and I, I won't, but I'm not going to go into the sort of the whys and the wherefores of that here. But what I do want to say is, even if you're not attracted to it, so if you are attracted to it, you've got a very quick and dirty reply to Hall that, that outright belief is the appropriate response to testimony, and this may well constitute knowledge, not degree of belief. Even if you aren't attracted to it, uh, it's still the case, it seems to me, that knowledge is made available very straightforwardly by testimony. And here's the mechanism. I'll run, I'll run through this. Uh, I don't want to get too... Uh, this can get quite intricate, uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll try and be brief. So, so there's a basic thought that, uh, you know, when someone tells me something, I've, there are two questions that I'm asking. Uh, do they know what they're talking about? Are they lying to me? Those are the two, two questions that are up for grabs. And we can formalise this a bit into a principle for the testimonial transmission of knowledge, which I call TTK, which is on the handout. Uh, so a hearer H knows a proposition P on the basis of testimony if, uh, but not only if, so it's a sufficient 
condition but not a necessary one. If the speaker asserts P, so they claim that P is the case, uh, the hearer knows that the speaker's assertion P is sincere. The hearer knows that the speaker is an epistemic authority over that proposition. And H comes to believe that proposition by competently deducing it from the assertion, sincerity and epistemic authority of the speaker. And if uh, someone asserts something sincerely, this is just sort of trivial tautological claim, someone asserts something sincerely only if they believe it, and they're an epistemic authority on P only if, uh, if the speaker believes P, then P, and if the speaker believes not P, then not P. And uh, I, won't go into, I won't go into the proof. You can, you can prove this sort of uh, you know, relatively simple um, uh, epistemic logic. Uh, but what you get there is all you need is those two claims which are known, namely sincerity and epistemic authority. And the, the, your belief, your resulting testimonial belief, will itself possess, possess uh, the property. It will, it will be, it will constitute knowledge uh, so, long as, um, so long as you've competently deduced it from those two uh, from those, those three premises, rather. Now, um, and I just want to try, just try and sort of elaborate. I'm just going to actually elaborate only one further point from that paragraph uh, on, on the handout. The, um, so, it, it's so you can get what I call cheap knowledge on this, the basis of this mechanism. So you've got these two crucial claims that you're trying to get at. So... Does the speaker know what they're talking about? Have they lied to you? You can come to know that the speaker knows what they're talking about on the basis of the speaker telling you. So let me put it this way. So uh, many of you don't know is a strangely hidden fact. It usually comes up in introductions, but, uh, but for the, helpfully for the purpose of this illustration, it didn't come up. So I was a soldier for five years. So, and I served in sort of different parts of the world. So I could now give you a proposition. I could tell you about, uh, uh, in Baghdad, the cross swords, um, uh, the helmets at the base of them are made with the helmets of Iranian soldiers who were killed in the Iran-Iraq war of the early 80s. Okay, so I've now made a claim. I've made a claim to you. Now, you, had I not told you that I was a soldier, you would not know whether or not that was something that I could be expected to know about. But if I tell you, I give you the grounds on which you can reasonably take me to have told you to know what I'm talking about, you can then come to know what it is, know whether I know about it. Does that make sense? So, because very often the speaker will be an authority over the kinds of things that they know for themselves. On, so this is going to be the case for all sorts of trivial things. So any sort of fact about your personal biography, your personal history, you, the speaker, will know whether or not you know it, uh, but no one else will know whether or not you know it. So the speaker then tells you, you know, if the speaker tells you that they, know, that, they're, 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 that they know whether they know this, you can then come to learn that, uh, that they're an epistemic authority on that issue. So actually all you need is knowledge for a whole, not for everything, but for a swathe of propositions, all you need is knowledge of the speaker's uh, moral character of their sincerity that they're not going to lie to you and you get the epistemic authority condition kind of for free and then on the basis of that you can then learn what it is that they've told you about. So all that sort of, uh, I hope it's not pulling a rabbit out of a hat but it's, but what it is is making sense of the intuition that I think, you know I certainly have and I think a lot of people have, that when you're deciding whether or not to trust someone their moral character is kind of the central thing that you're looking for. And if you've got the moral character in place, if you know that they're a person who's not going to lie to you, they're faithful and upright and person of integrity, etc., then you can come to know very easily all the things that they tell you. Okay, so what's my reply to Hall? Well, the individual inquirer's adoption of credences towards hypotheses rather than belief is required only insofar as they're engaged on science narrowly construed. So that's the kind of the, you know, in the lab doing experiments. Uh, for inquiry construed widely, testimony may properly be believed outright, and it may constitute knowledge, and it may be, may be taken to constitute knowledge. So core religious doctrines are in the latter category. And this is why it seems to be perfectly legitimate that in 
church, mosque, synagogue, uh, and so forth. You can claim to know something, you can expect to know something because you believe it, as long as you believe it on appropriate grounds, uh, you have reason to think that the, uh, the, the testifier is an authority on that matter, and they're not lying to you. Your, your resulting belief will then be outright belief and not a matter of credences. So that's my response to the first, uh, first objection. Let's go on to the second one, on to uh, the norms that structure uh, epistemic communities. So um, one way of thinking about testimony is, uh, um, so, so the scientists, when they go into their lab, you know, they're going to the coal face of knowledge and they're getting their pickaxe out and they're trying to hew these diamonds of undiscovered truth, which we previously didn't possess. And you then have a bucket chain which passes the diamonds on out to the light of day. And these other sources of knowledge are like the, the, the miners at the coalface with the pickaxe. Testimony is then the bucket chain. It sort, of, it sort of passes it along so that those who haven't discovered it for themselves then get it. And testimony is sort of it's the magic bucket chain because every step along the way it multiplies. You, know, you don't lose it when you, when you pass it on. So it's a preservative source of knowledge. Seems fairly obvious. Now, communities which have testimonial deposits are responsible, I say, uh, for the accurate preservation of that report. So what does this look like? Uh, well, uh, this responsibility is going to be discharged through two main mechanisms. So one is institutions uh, and one is norms. So there's going to be some kind of norm uh, which requires this. And the norm in this case is one of active, accurate uh, transmission. And I've given some uh, biblical references there. And this is because this is to places where we actually see in the Bible this norm being, uh, being endorsed and proclaimed. So Deuteronomy in particular, very strong commandments uh, for, the, for the Jewish people to, to teach their children and their children's children all that you've learnt today at, uh, at, Mount, at Mount Horeb. There's a very strong... Uh, norm going on there. New Testament, Paul writing to Timothy, I take it, uh, what you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful, uh, faithful people who will be able to teach others also. So the very clear, I've told you this in the presence of many people who attest for what it is that I've said, give that to other people who are going to be able to give that to other people. So there's a norm of accurate transmission that's being endorsed there. And the institution is going to be effective in that task only if it makes sure that the members of the institution adhere to the norm. So you've got to make sure that the people you put in the institution which is responsible for the transmission of the report, that they buy into the basic project of, um, uh, of, of doing so, of, being, of, of transmitting this accurately. And it also seems to me that communities are likely to outperform sequences of individuals uh, in preserving a testimonial deposit. So I've got some uh, uh, sort of little diagrams for it. So this is not my, this is not my work, I'm sort of, I'm poaching. Uh, I'm multiplying knowledge by using someone else's work, uh, work here. So in that first one, we, so we've got a proposition P, and then we've got, um, so AAP uh, is just taken to represent A, a person attests that P. So an event happens, A says that the event has happened, they tell it to B, B also says that the event has happened, and it goes on down the chain. Now your immediate thought in looking at that is, okay, uh, haven't we all played Chinese whispers at school? You know, like this is, this is sort of, this is the worry, isn't it? That although it may be AAP, it's going to be BAQ, you know, or, or, or Z, or worse, it's going to, it's going to sort of disappear as, uh, as time goes on. So, so you can get slightly more sophisticated va variants. So the second chain, uh, A attests that P, and then B attests, that A attests, that P. And then the third one along, C attests, that B attests, that A attests, that P, and so forth. And then maybe when we get to the end, every link in the testimonial chain has been attested that that they attest. Okay, moving further on, it gets sort of slightly more... So that seems a bit unrealistic, because for any length of chain, you're going to kind of drop out pretty quickly uh, what's going on. So you could get uh, a situation where uh, the event happens, A attests that P, B attests that A attests that P, but then for everyone afterwards they just say that the, I was told this by the previous person and kind of that's, that's 
it stops, and then you're reliant on the chain. But things then can then get much more robust when you start to introduce multiple lines of testimonial transition. So this is what's going on in the fourth one. So P, the event happens, three people are witnesses to the event, and they all tell someone that something has happened. And those three people also all tell one other person, and those three people all tell one other person, and then all those three people tell the same person. So if you've got reason to believe that those three testimonial chains are independent, the person at the end is actually going to have very, very strong grounds because there's independent attestation of the same event which has been preserved through three chains. So the Chinese whispers worry begins to drop away when you've got multiple attestation. And then diagram five, it gets even uh, sort of more interconnected. So you can see how you've got one witness to the event and then you have three people attesting to this one person's witness and then a further three people but who each may have exposure to more than one of the witnesses at the second chain and so forth onto the fifth one. And if you have multiple interconnections at each level of the chain, you can have very, very robust reason to take it that the testimonial report has been accurately preserved. And uh, you can sort of do a little bit of homework to, to sort of work out what your, um, uh, you know, for a particular religious tradition, what the, what the, the testimonial chain looks like. Uh, so I take it for Christianity. Uh, well, it depends what you're taking to be the original event, whether you're taking Jesus to be the original testify, as I think John in his gospel does, or whether you're taking the events of Jesus' life to be the event which is then attested. So taking the, taking the second one, we've got the events of Jesus' life, and we've got four gospel sources which have independent material in them. And these are then preserved through the church. So at any one point, the church is then saying, here are the four sources which are attesting to that one event. So what you have then is very robust uh, preservation, as long as the textual record is there, of the original sources. And then you've got the, the sort of the evidential work of seeing these four sources insofar as how coherently they attest to the original event. So, so how can I, so let's, let's sort of make this concrete in reply to uh, Ned's, Ned's claim. So the wide reading of the permit heresy norm is false. Okay, so there are going to be some forms of inquiry in which truth is preserved uh, and we come to know things which require the community involved to adhere to a totally different norm, uh, which is a norm of accurate, active transmission. And that may very, very properly be one in which you say you're not being faithful to the report that we have to transmit and therefore we're going to try and socially exclude you from the institution which is responsible for preserving that. Now, uh, just to sort of then qualify, uh, so what we've got, what the, what the testimonial chain does is it preserves the original report and takes it to, makes it available to other people uh, later on as accurately as possible. The interpretation of the significance of that report will then be one which is subject to the, the free thinking permit heresy uh, kind of norm. Other things being equal, ceteris paribus, and it may well be that in this particular case there are other reasons for the ceteris paribus a clause not to be uh, not to be satisfied, but I won't I won't get into that. Okay, so uh, let me let me just draw this to a close with uh, I think some of the implications, some of the significance of uh, of what I've been trying to highlight. So my central claim that I've if there's one takeaway that uh, that you get from tonight uh, is that it seems to me religious belief for re revealed religions is rationally evaluable according to testimonial norms. Have I trusted the right person? Have I, have I got good reason to take them to be authoritative about what it is that they're claiming? Are they lying to me? Are there alternative explanations for, uh, for, for what it is that they've said? And that's, that, it, that process of evaluation is one that actually all of us are very familiar with because all of us evaluate testimony all the time, every day. And it's, it's in some sense, it's, it's distinctive of testimony. So even though testimony overall may be uh, epistemically valuable because, uh, because it permits the kind of inductive inferences uh, which, um, uh, you know, which are epistemically valuable, the practice of testimony relies on a different kind of mode of operation. And it's, it's, when, you op when it's operated in that way, then you get the then you get the, um, uh, the sort of the second level inductive correlations. 
but it's evaluable according to testimonial norms. Okay. Now, if this picture that I've been trying to paint is right, it explains, I suggest, why interreligious dialogue has this kind of in principle inconclusivity about it. Because there's no new evidence that's going to, uh, that's going to come in. What we've got is these uh, claims of revelation at some point in history, and uh, the individualists are trying to work out uh, whether, indeed, whether which one, if any, uh, they, they, they take to be a genuine revelation. Um, uh, th th there's nothing else that you're going to get access to to help make a decision to that other than the things that we've got uh, than, we've, than, we've, than we've inherited from history. So the kind of, I'm waiting for more evidence to come in, it's just, it's just sort of not applicable in, uh, in, this, in this context. And it seems to me that that's a desirat. So this is not the only way of thinking about the justification of religious belief uh, that there is, but it seems to me a desideratum on any viable explanation of um, or any viable claim justification of religious belief that it explains how other people can come to very different uh, views on these matters. And I think it also just sort of finally explains some of the severity uh, um, of, of interreligious disagreement. Uh, and indeed, not just interreligious, but but religious with non-religious disagreement. Um, you know, hopefully, we all learn to live together in the same world. Uh, but nonetheless, when you've decided not to trust someone whom someone else takes to be trustworthy, all that kind of that moral reaction of of you dis you've disres you dis you've disrespected this person. Whom I whom I have set my life by is all activated by all activated in that situation. So there's, there's a kind of unavoidable uh, moral clash that's going on uh, with, it, it's not purely different evaluations of evidence that are going on, it's there are different testifiers who've pledged their word according to different religious traditions um, and you have not, you have, you have distrusted uh, whichever the one is that that that, um, that I favour, and that's not to sink into relativism. You know, it's, it, you know there is there's the, there's a truth of the matter out there, uh, but it is to say this is how um, epistemically serious people who want to get at the truth can come to very differing uh, conclusions, and um, uh, uh, and 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 for that conclusion to be marked by strong uh, moral discord. So. Uh, I'll finish there. Uh, that's a lot of content, and I look forward to some uh, robust discussion. Well, I'm sure we'd all want to thank Tom very much for a very stimulating lecture. And we're going to move into time of questions and answers. I'm going to ask uh, Ignacio if you take the microphone round. To get things going uh, while you're thinking about better questions, here's one just to get us underway. And th this story picks you up uh, at the beginning of your lecture. I mean, I mean Ned Hall was saying, look, um, science has certain epistemic virtues compared to religion, but you know, maybe those same issues might also apply to political issues, to moral issues. I mean, all the scientists I know are human beings. And, and you know, they, they may well use one mode of thinking in the lab, reaching provisional, revisable judgments, which are not actually existentially particularly significant. And then they go home, and there's a moral crisis. They've got to do something. And do they flip into a different mode of thinking? Are, are they different people, or is it just that actually we, we do operate with different modes of thinking dependent on what the situation is? Yeah. Um... So I, I take it that the stakes that are involved in religious matters are, you know, are generally going to be so much greater. Uh, obviously, if the Large Hadron Collider had had sort of turned the Earth into a black hole, that would have been pretty high stakes. But um, uh, but absent that, the sort of the day-to-day -day business of science, the, the stakes are, are low, and the stakes in religious matters are are eternal. So that is going to that's going to create a certain kind of significance. But I think he'd probably push back on that point and say, well, it may well be that the stakes are, uh, are super high, but you you know you should still you should still moderate your belief according to the evidence, and that's that's one thing. And then once you've come to what you think the right belief is in that situation, then you've got to uh, kind of jolly well hope that you're right. <laughs> um, but but the sort of the other point about moral and political judgments, yeah. So so then then we're into uh, sort of deep questions around uh, the nature of are these cognitive attitudes which are 
responding to, in some sense, the way the world is, moral reasons, political reasons, or are these more emotive attitudes which, uh, which we just can't help ourselves slipping into, but have no more justification than our, than our, our kind of, that's the way we're wired. And um, obviously philosophers disagree <laughs> over those matters. And um, I mean, there, there, there could well be a, a, you know, a parallel claim that we should be similarly tentative about those, about those kind of moral judgments that, that we make. I mean, that's, you know, that's, not, that's, that's, not, that's not totally implausible. I mean, I disagree with it, but it's, but it's not totally implausible. But yeah, thank you very much. That's, that's very helpful. Mm. Yes, thank you very much for your talk. I thought it was very positive, which was very good. I think that is what we need more of. And I think that it's um, what you said about uh, the contentions of Ned Hall. It's probably true that a, a lot of believers um, um, it's, don't necessarily have um, a complete... Um, they, there is an uncertainty because of the... Uh, the um, with Ned Hall's arguments makes them doubt in some way are not hold as um, as firmly um, as they should what what the church teaches. So some there is a um, so, so my um, what I'd like to, to ask is whether um, sh by putting testimony at the, at the basis of uh, belief, it gives them grounds to um, it can strengthen their belief and thereby make them be able to give better testimony to other people to. Uh, to, to be um, able to be better evangelizers for the religious belief that they possess. Great, thank you. Um, so, uh, so there's a sort of. Did you want to come in on that, Andrew? Was it a thing? Yeah, so yeah. Just flag up for another question. Okay. Um, so, uh, yeah. So good. So two two reflections. So one is, um, in some sense, testimony makes you more aware, I think, of your exposure as a, as a believer, to use that term, both in its religiously specific sense, someone who believes, and the sort of the general epistemic sense, namely that you're reliant on another person. So when you're reliant on another person, you're kind of, you're, you are stepping out on a limb and you're, you're uh, you just, you know, you jolly well hope that that person has, has told you the truth. So, so in that sense, I think there's actually a, a kind of humility that comes with belief on the basis of testimony, because what you've done is you've you've kind of, I mean, it's sort of metaphorical language, but you've let go of control over your over your beliefs, and you've t you've taken on trust what someone else has said. So, so I th I think there's a there's an element of. Um, um, but then, in the, you know, in the in the religious context, it's God ultimately who's the source of source of these uh, uh, source of the the revelation. And so, insofar, you know, Paul says, "I know whom I've believed, um, and I'm persuaded that He's able to keep me until that final day." So, and I think that's then very distinctive. You know, I'm reliant, but I'm reliant on God, and that's 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 not a that's not a um, it's an exposed, but it's not a it's, but it's not a dangerous position to be in. In terms, in terms of uh, the significance for um, for religious people sharing their faith, I think so. One one thing it says, one of the implications is that um, the the, con the the content of religious belief, the, or the argument for it, will, will consist in pointing the finger away from yourself to say, uh, you know, in those testimonial chains, a you know, b attests that a attests that p. Uh, the contemporary religious believer is saying, I heard this from dot dot dot, and you're pointing backwards basically to the, the point of revelation in history. Um, but I think as well, I mean, insofar as personal religious experience, communal experience will play a role in attesting, grounding your faith, uh, that will also be something that you will then give, give, te give testimony to. And, uh, and I think that also makes sense of why <laughs> Kind of the, the you know who it is that's 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 doing the sharing of their faith then becomes a very significant matter because um, because those who are the skeptic who's unconvinced is is as much weighing up you as weighing up 
the the reasons that you that you might be given. So, but thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. That was a really excellent talk, uh, clarifying the, the, the landscape of issues and actually struck a bit of a chord with me because I was taught by a nuclear physicist here 25 years ago who really thought that nothing, uh, that the only things exist are the only things that exist are the things you can measure. And I could actually uh, argue with him today, but I couldn't at that time. Um, so uh, so thank, you, thank you for this. Um, I just wonder, with, with, with his testimony, um, whether you're regarding it as, as the main source of, um, uh, sort of epistemic, epistemic um, uh, guarantees, or whether it's part of a constellation of other things. And here are some other things. So, for example, when testimony works in a religious community, it's normally uh, together with coherence. Uh, how does it cohere with what I already know, cohere with what people knew in the past, and so on. Um, uh, th then there's authority. There's testimony by particular kinds of persons or groups invested with a certain something extra, whatever that is. Um, and then there's also something taken, uh, inspired by the encounter between Moses and God on Mount Sinai, because God gives three identifications of himself. And the third one is that um, he says that the call will be fruitful. So you will worship God in this mountain, which seems impossible to you at this time, and it does come to pass. So there's a kind of fruitfulness as well, um, uh, which is often seems to play into a coherence over time and fruitfulness over time, which also seems to play into part of the evaluation process. So I'd like to comment on any of these things. Thank you. Yeah, good. Um... Yeah, so I, I'm very much not making a, a sort of like a global necessity claim that this is the way and the only way in which you could come to religious belief. Um, and so there could be a plethora of other ways. So religious experience would be one. Uh, and I've, I, you know, I've said nothing to preclude the possibility of a successful natural theology. Um, I'm, I'm sort of politely dubious about that, the prospects of that myself, but that's my sort of personal philosophical view and other people differ. Uh, and, um, you know, and so, that, so there, there could be a plurality of ways in which people might come to know uh, central theistic claims. Um, I think what I, I, I definitely am making a stronger claim that the doctrinal content that's characteristic of most of the major religions, uh, you get only on the basis of testimony. But it may be that the grounds on which you accept that testimony are, are multiple, are various, uh, which, lead you, which lead you towards it. So, um, so, so there's, got to be, there's got to be some testimonial reasoning at the heart of it. But, I mean, and indeed, that's, that's kind of in some sense consistent. I've been presenting a kind of very narrowly focused view of testimony here and that, that's going to be consistent with, um, with our testimonial practice in other contexts. So the, um, when, uh, I mean, it's very interesting historically that a lot of the, there's a lot of early discussion around testimony at the, at the start of the Enlightenment, 17th century um, and uh, 17th and 18th century. And really, because one, one of the characteristic hallmarks of that period is the rejection of authority, uh, certainly the traditional forms of authority. And that authority is both political, telling people what to do, kings, uh, kings being substituted by the people, but it's also intellectual. And so this is where there's this deep scepticism about testimony that emerges at that time. Anyway, in one of the texts that treated at the time, the, the Port Royal Logic, um, uh, distinguish between intrinsic and extrinsic evidences for testimony. So I've been really dealing with the intrinsic evidences for testimony, so the, the authority and probity of the testifier. But there could equally, you know, there are very frequently extrinsic evidences, namely the, the intrinsic probability or the, or the sort of the, the, the prior probability rather of the likelihood of what they're testifying to being true. And you'll often get a trade-off between the two. So um, um, insofar as you think that something's very, very unlikely, then you're, you're, you're kind of, you're going to, the person who's doing the testifying has got to really strike you as someone who knows their stuff and is, and is not going to be lying to you. So there's, there's, there's very much going to be a trade-off there. But that doesn't prevent, I mean, it, whatever the principle there, it can't be so strong as to prevent you ever learning, learning something surprising. 
Uh, so, you know, Marco Polo turns up to the prince in India and says, ice exists. And uh, um, uh, had the prince been able to believe Marco Polo, he, the prince would have come to know that, that ice existed, but it just sounded so extraordinary, the idea that water could become solid, that, um, that he refused to believe in the tale. So, but yeah, thank you very much. Do you want to come back on any of that? Uh, well, just uh, you mentioned in passing about the what? Sorry. Uh, well, th well, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, you mentioned in passing about the you didn't particularly like the, the the second personal account of testimony. So this is an alternative school. Um, do you see it as complementary or um, exclusive? Is it different? Uh, so, so, <laughs> so the, the the articulations of that broadly second personal take on testimony, Richard Moran's view, uh, are. Uh, are marked in some sense by their slipperiness. They're very hard to get a handle on exactly what's going on there. I suppose my own view is that there's, 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 there's so to speak, there's two tracks going on. So there's the moral interaction of pledging your word. I actually don't think there's a moral obligation to believe what someone says. There's a moral obligation that uh, the, the person who speaks places themselves under a commitment to have spoken truthfully. And I accept their commitment, but that's a very different thing to believe they fulfilled that commitment. So you can see the distinction in the case of promises much more clearly. So I promise to give you £100 in a week. Okay. Uh, so there's two attitudes you can take to that. So one is you can accept the promise. So you could say, no, no, don't accept the promise. You're not on. And then I'm like, okay, so in two days, later, I'm not under the obligation because you haven't accepted the promise. But if you accept the promise and we could make it formal, we could write it on a bit of paper and sign it. The, the obligation then exists for me to give you the £100. Now, whether or not you believe that I'll give you the £100, well, there's all sorts of things that could, that could go into that. And I think the same things are going on in testimony. So there's, an, so there's what we do when we're giving testimony is we accept the other person's obligation of truthfulness. Um, that's just kind of built into the conversational structure. But, uh, but whether or not we believe the other person is, is I think, a, in some sense, a private matter. To tell them that you don't believe them is, the, is rude. But, <laughs> uh, but there's no obligation to do that. So. Oh, um, my name is Zia Karali. Basically, my question is, there's one thing I really understand is that if you believe that someone's uh, trustful, then the test, everything that follows on, then you should believe it because he's not a liar. And that's testimony. Um, but to me, what, I, what, always, what really always confused me is that doesn't science have testimony just as much as religion has testimony, and then again, it depends which religion we're talking about because there's a thousand religions. So that's one point. The other point, epistemology is very good because it's allowing us to explore supposedly in an ethical way and in an objective way that whether something is truthful and coherent is maybe the word or not, but then again, religion, every religion has a certain epistemology, I would assume, and science has an epistemology. But when we talk about science, sometimes it seems as if science is something that is not questionable in terms of epistemology. We sort of tend to focus on the epistemology of religion as being incoherent. But what about when science is incoherent? I mean, look at Newton, classical physics, and then quantum physics, they're not coherent. Um, and then uh, should there be the, therefore another term used rather than religion and science is a knowledge which is the main factor and then we should derive science out of knowledge as existence, as what is existence and derive from very a priori maybe, it's the wrong term but in the Kantian sense a priori knowledge and derive things whether it's religion or science or Again, natural science, some other sort of science. It's too confusing. It's not classified, not categorized. But maybe what we need to do is categorize the knowledges. That's really the question. Yeah. So just prompt me on the first one again. Um, just prompt me on the first question again. Yeah, my first question yeah. was... Uh, about like doesn't science as much as uh... yeah de depend on testimony okay good so um so in answer to the first one uh, yes absolutely the, the practice of science does depend on testimony very significantly and sociologists of science have spent a lot of time and written a lot of stuff on this and, f and philosophers the early testimony debate was also prompted by this recognition and um, i mean certainly for most kind of science um, and also to, to, to see the, the depth of the reliance on it uh, is, 
you realise it when you see the scandals that come out about bad science when, um, you know, the one that sticks in my mind was the South Korean geneticist who basically made up all, all his data for a long time. And, um, and his results, results had been taken as valid just because they were published in the right journals, etc. So, so the practice of science is absolutely pervasively dependent on successful testimony. But certainly for the majority of, the, the vast majority of science, the, the actual kind of acquisition of knowledge in the first place is not, it's not testimony all the way down, so to speak. There's, there's a point at which it's non-testimonial. Now, so I'm going to be slightly off piste here, but it's then an interesting question as to whether you can have scientific knowledge, which is testimony all the way down, with, with very powerful computers. Uh, because it seems like, so you may have mathematical proofs which no person has gone through all the process. So we're already familiar with the idea of teams of mathematicians constructing a proof which individual members of the team have proved portions of and when you put it all together you get a proof for an overall theorem. Um, but we're increasingly getting mathematical theorems which have been proved by computers in the same way which no person has even successfully, that no, no, no individual person has had, I sort of corroboration of the proof at every step. Is this, is this mathematical knowledge? So if it is, that seems like it's going to be mathematical knowledge. There's almost, well, it, you know, it's an interesting question. Is that testimony all the way down in some sense? The, di the difference in the, in the religious case um, is that at least some of the content is, if I'm right about that claim about the, the kind of the doctrinal content, that you can't get it on the basis of, um, so like sticking with the Christian case, you know, Jesus could have walked around on earth done a bunch of miracles, been resurrected from the dead. From that alone, you can't conclude many significant Christian claims. I mean, you don't get the incarnation out of that. You don't get the atonement out of that. You only get those claims on the basis of Jesus having said something or the apostles having said something. So, that, so there's, a, there's a point at which it is testimony all the way down, so to speak, that someone knows some is in a privileged position with respect to this fact, and they tell you what the fact is. So I think there is an asymmetry between religion and science, nonetheless, at that stage. In terms of, uh, but you're very right to point out that uh, it does seem like science, the practice of science, has some, some kind of background assumptions which are not um, empirically provable. They, you know, in some sense, they need to be taken on faith. So the, the, the um, the kind of consistency of the, you know, the law governness, the law governed nature of, of, of physical reality. That, I mean, that's certainly something that scientists, working scientists, have to take on trust in some of this. I think it's, you know, it's, it's not, I'm reluctant to say, well, look, they just take that on faith and we just take God on faith and they're, they're the same kind of thing. I'm, I'm sort of, I'm very cautious about that, but, but maybe that's a longer, maybe that's a longer discussion. I guess, I guess the sort of debate, I mean, doesn't the basic worry arise that's, I mean, there just is no doubt, like, the science has been so successful for these hundreds of years, and we're now the beneficiaries of that. And, and whatever, the, you know, whatever the, the truth that underlies religion, if any, I mean, it is susceptible to global doubt. You might just think the whole thing is massively in error. Like, there are lots of people who think that, and it's not totally, it's not totally implausible. I mean, you could see, well, I certainly can, maybe, uh, you know, in my, in my sort of dark, dark nights, the soul, the soul, I sort of wake up at 4 a.m. and I think, have I, just, have I just got all this wrong? You know, have I just sort of um, uh, invested my life in a pack of cards? So, you know, so, so, but I don't have that worry about science. So, it's, so that asymmetry of that worry is, is, um, is, uh, is, I think, what causes the discussion. But thank you. Yeah. And some of the points I want to raise have already been covered by your responses already, but I just want to um, expand a little bit on the idea of our confidence in testimony and the way we receive it. We all analyse it in some way to see whether, as you say, it was coherent. And so we do subject it to other tests other than just trust. <laughs> but I wanted to ask if you could comment a bit on the possible confusion about what's being transmitted. Um, if, for example, Christianity consisted simply of a, a set of propositions about God, that we could listen to the testimony handed down um, 
and make up our minds whether we believe them or not. But as I understand it, Christianity isn't just, not even, not at all, just a set of propositions or doctrines that it involves what you said, personal experience, mm -hmm. which is something which we can experimentally test so that what's being passed down by a testimony is not just a set of propositions, but an invitation to experience God for ourselves. And for most people, I think, for me, that's the cruncher. <laughs> if I'd found that everything I'd been told didn't work, and uh, then either I'm doing something wrong or I've misunderstood what I've been told, and I ought in humility to try and find that out. Uh, but my faith is built not just on what I've been told, but on what I've experienced mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. And that the Christian faith is about our experience of God. And the testimony helps us make sure we just don't go off on a little personal tangent of our own. Um, so I wonder if you want to comment on whether what's being transmitted is more than just a set of propositions or something more like an invitation to experience something for ourselves. Mm, good, good. Um, so, yeah, undoubtedly, undoubtedly. And um, what I've... Uh, um, because it's so contested whether Christian belief or religious belief is justified. Articulating a way in which it can be evaluated epistemically is a, is a, is a, is a really important starting point, but it is only a starting point. And in particular, I've been dealing with a rather flat notion of, um, of the, the way speech works. I've just been dealing with declarative sentences that tell you that that's the way the world is. And sitting here in Oxford, we don't, we don't need to be reminded that there's other things you can do with words other than describe the way the world is. So J.L. Austin has this very famous book, How to Do Things with Words, where he draws attention to the, all the other kinds of speech acts. And, and there are invitations and there are exhortations and there are promises and there are encouragements. And you know, there's, there's a whole panoply of speech acts that are out there other than declarative sentences. And clearly in, in, a, in, any, uh, in any religious tradition worth its salt, there's, you know, there's going to be a whole bunch of other stuff going on that's other than just propositions about the world. So, so there's, no, there's no question whatsoever that all of that ties in. In terms of, in terms of the... I mean, I suppose that's to then touch on other themes that we were thinking about earlier. You know, the corroborating force of other, kind, other kinds of, of understanding understandings of the world, of which personal encounters with God may be one, which has a kind of corroborating force. And, and I think as well, you, you, then have, you then have passed down through traditions um, kind of descriptions and interpretations of what those kinds of encounters are like. And, and when you, the current believer, then have those similar experiences, it both gives you an interpretive framework and, and gives a kind of corroborating force that, that this is ridicule and, and Belongs in this, in this tradition. So I'm, I'm very, amen very amenable to that idea. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, have you taken up the. Um, oh, thank uh, you. My name is Tom Fogan. <laughs> have you taken up uh, the issue of law, how testimony is a source of knowledge in law, and how legal norms which are concerned with testing the epistemic authority of, let's say, an expert witness as well as the sincerity of that, that witness uh, may be contrasted with testimony as a source of knowledge and religion. It seems to me that in further developing the analysis, one would go beyond the contrast between science mm -hmm. and religion to consider how law deals with uh, testimony as a source of knowledge. Great, great, yeah, and and um, the way I've been using testimony is until you start doing philosophy, uh, the immediate context in which you understand it is is the law court because that's that's where we actually use the word naturally to say so and so gave testimony at the court of law, and um, I I should have said earlier you know it's very much being used as 
in, in this philosophical debate as just a term of art for any declaration about the way the world is. Yeah, so, um, so law, uh, so th the nature of law is such that uh, something's got to go gone wrong and probably quite badly in order for you to get there. Uh, I mean, so there are some mundane things that law deals with, but if, if someone's testimony is at issue, then something's gone wrong somewhere. And so, and so both of those considerations are up for testing. Are they lying? Are they, do they know what they're talking about? Because uh, both of those can't be taken for granted in the law court. So in some sense, the law, I would suggest, can be a bit of a false friend in this respect. That um, we, we, so think about hearsay. So in the law courts, hearsay is not legally admissible. So I can't on the stand say, my mum told me that Johnny was back late that night. In order for it to be admissible testimony, my mum has to get up on the, on, the, on the stand, take the oath and say, Johnny was back late that night. So it's got to be first-hand attestation. But outside of that, that's, that can be a perfectly legitimate way of coming to acquire belief. You know, I was told this by so-and-so and, -so and I, now, I now believe it. So the standards that we have in the law courts will tend to be higher than our everyday epistemic standards. Now, you may, you may think in the religious context, uh, the standards ought to be higher. That's not obvious to me. You know, it seems to me that it's, it's, the point is to get at the truth on roughly the kind of dilemma that I was at or, or sort of reaction that I was putatively ascribing to Hall in relation to the stakes. You know, just because the stakes are higher doesn't mean that you're doesn't mean that you treat the treat the the kind of the reasons for belief that you have any more stringently. It just means that you, you, you you're kind of you're gonna go over the calculation twice to make sure you've got it right. So um, so I'm sure there is there is a bunch to be learnt from it, but but you need to but but there are these pitfalls to, to direct application. Across. Did you have a, something particular in mind? So obviously, in the law court, mm. cross-examination is insisted on, uh, both in terms of uh, testing sincerity, but oh. uh, also on the part of the judge who would be evaluating the, uh, the epistemic authority of the witness as an expert. Mm. So I, I would think that um, the, uh, uh, the, the source of knowledge in the religious context would be in contrast to what's insisted on in the courts, just as in science uh, the source of knowledge would not be, the method would be the, uh, the appropriate uh, method for religion. Mm -hmm. so I, but I, I think that it, it may be helpful to explore further and work out in detail uh, mm -hmm. the uh, the, the norms and the rules of evidence in the law courts, since so much confidence uh, is lent to them, and yeah. uh, and build the case for uh, religious knowledge, uh, mm. uh, nonetheless. Mm, absolutely, and and the the process of cross examination you know, is clearly valuable because it it gives a judge or a jury a sense of the robustness of the account that's been offered, and I, I think. Day-to-day -day conversation serves actually the same function. You know that there's a there's a to and fro of examination and understanding of the implications, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And um, so I, I suppose that seems to me significant that we have. Uh, you know, we don't just have here's a speech that Jesus made, for instance, and kind of that's it. You know, that there's a whole life, and that it's it's conversationally couched so that you're you're seeing. Even though you can't do that cross-examination, conversational cross-examination yourself, you can see others who've done that and judge for yourself what the, the output from that is. So that's, that's, that's just to say that the context for making a judgment about trustworthiness is not just a statement. It's, it's a conversation. It's, an, it's a process of interaction, which gives, you, which gives you more of a handle on someone's trustworthiness. So you just hit one more. Yeah. Thank you. This is most interesting. As you've been talking, my mind has been moving away from uh, communal testimony and communities working in science or reinforcing each other rigid towards relatively isolated instances. 
And I'm not sure that I perfectly follow this point, but if we were to imagine somebody who were marooned, or perhaps decided at a very early age to be a hermit, and had probably some, some essential knowledge, say a very simple little religious book, and possibly some very simple scientific education, if that, that person would be able to deduce, sci apply scientific thought to the environment. Would that person, if that person were to take, shall I say, the ele very elementary testimony and over years of isolation enrich, develop it, and so forth, the question then would be, presuming that that person, or po possibly there was some way of recording it, that person would be reintegrated into a community, how would that community, the scientific community, would be able to update and, uh, as it were, verify whatever had been deduced in isolation? But would the religious community be able to accept conclusions drawn more or less independently? Hmm. So... Um... Is that reasonably lucid? I mean, yeah, I, th I, I think I understand. So, so I, I guess there would just be, in the religious context, there's, you'd have to distinguish between two things very clearly. So one is, um, you know, suppose they'd lost, they'd lost the book. Yes. Could they, were they able to accurately relay, retell the content of it? So that's the, that's the equivalent to the testimonial transmission. And then the second is then... Uh, is kind of understanding its significance yes, and, and you know, so, yeah. So maybe they've written a treatise, you know, yes. kind of <laughs> how my life has been enriched by this text. And what I, I suppose my suggestion is that that is going to be other things being equal is going to be um, <coughs> subject to the same. Uh, that person is just on a par with everyone else in the religious community who's doing the same, doing the same sort of thing, trying to understand the significance of the text. And so there's going to be an inherent provisionality about about understanding, Thank you. Uh, understanding that. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I think we'd very much like to thank Thompson for what was a very engaging, very winsomely delivered lecture, and also for some very good questions. I think some very good answers as well. So thank you very much. Thank you very much.